I would like to thank Rabbi Kleinbaum and Cantor Rosen for asking me to speak at this year's Yom HaShoah program. My name is Martin Pearl, and I am the son of Holocaust survivors Suzanne and Otto Pearl. This evening, I will focus on the life of my late father, Otto, who was born on September 22, 1915, at Schiffamsgasse, number 18, in Vienna's second district, also known as Leopoldstadt. During the reign of Emperor Franz Joseph and the extremely turbulent times of World War I. My father's uncle, Victor Knopfmacher, was just 21 years old when he was killed in battle in July 1915, just two months before my father's birth. Many of you here today will recognize the name Leopoldstadt from the current Broadway play written by Tom Stoppard. This area was once filled with vibrant Jewish life. Jews represented half of the entire population in the district. My, mother's, my father's mother, Martha, whose maiden name was Knufmacher, was born in 1891 in the Moravian town of Auschwitz, known in Czech as Hustepec, then part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Martha, along with her parents, Moritz and Rosalia, as well as her six siblings, moved to Vienna in 1904. Her parents and extended family members owned many well-known cafes in Vienna. My grandfather, Leopold Pearl, was born in 1883 in the small village of Shikator, located in Western Hungary. As a young boy, Leopold came to live with his maternal grandparents, who were residents of Vienna since the 1870s. His six siblings remained in Hungary. My grandparents were married in Vienna in December 1913. My father had a younger brother, Kurt, who was born in 1917. Although my grandparents, my father, and my uncle lived in a neighborhood with a significant Jewish population, they themselves were not particularly observant. In fact, my father, on the right, and uncle did not have bar mitzvah ceremonies. My grandfather, Leopold, served in the Austrian army in World War I and owned a leather goods business on the same street as their home. My father belonged to the Hakoa Sports Club, which was founded in Vienna in 1909. It was the largest and best known Jewish sports club at, in the, of the interwar period. The successes of the soccer teams and swimmers are legendary. My father was an avid hiker and loved to ski. Since there were very difficult economic times after Austria's loss in World War I, followed by great inflation, unemployment during the Depression, my grandfather encouraged my father to learn a practical trade, such as tailoring. My father became quite accomplished and excelled in this craft. My father was always very, he's in the center. My father was always politically aware and his own father was very involved with the Social Democrats in Austria. Later in life, my father recalled his experiences of these sinister times. My parents spoke with their eyewitness accounts during the Shoah at CBST Kristallnacht program in 1997 at, con at the congregation's Bethune Street location. My parents were both interviewed and gave testimony to the USC Shoah Foundation in 1996. They have both appeared in an Austrian-produced documentary, Vienna's Lost Daughters, released in 2007, and my father was featured in an Austrian TV program about his youth in Vienna and his life and career in New York. What I'd like to do now is read excerpts from my father's notes when he spoke to CBST 26 years ago. This is what he said. I was born in Vienna, went to school in Vienna, and in March 1937 was inducted into the Austrian army and served in infantry regiment number four. The political and economic situation was very uneasy because Austria was surrounded in the north by Nazi Germany and by fascist Italy in the south. But the feeling was that England and France would not permit a German occupation of Austria. But on March 13, 1938, Hitler's army marched into Austria. Tanks rolled in and dozens of airplanes flew over the city. Hitler was met by enthusiastic crowds. I was discharged from the army and I returned home. 
A few weeks later, the Gestapo rang my family's doorbell in the middle of the night. I was arrested and taken into protective custody. I was held in a makeshift prison set up in a neighborhood school building. Most of the other prisoners were well-known lawyers, judges, union leaders, and members of the Socialist City Council. I was possibly one of the youngest prisoners. Then the big lie started. We were told we would have to help build a dam because of heavy spring floods in some parts of uh, Austria. We arrived at the Vienna train station. Music was playing very loudly, and everything was still very civilized. Since the train, once the train started to move, the, the situation changed at once. Uniform US men, US, uniformed SS men appeared with guns and started to beat us without mercy. We had to sit tightly, packed together, with our hands behind our heads, and look continuously at one light bulb. If you turned your head, you were beaten. We heard terrible screams from beatings and the rattle of gunfire. Some of the prisoners were beaten so badly that they committed suicide by jumping through the windows of the moving train. A small old man was sitting facing me. He whispered to me that he had a gold watch in his pocket, and he would give it to me because I was still young and I could survive this ordeal. When I whispered back that I didn't want to take his watch, an SS man heard me and started to beat me with a leather whip. I had to count 25 times and repeat that I am a lousy Jew pig with no order to drink or food or toilet. We traveled for over 24 hours without knowing where we were going. Finally, the train sh slowed down and stopped. We arrived at our destination. To our horror, we were in Dachau. The entrance had this big sign which read, Arbeit mach frei. Work will make you free. Another big lie. Because not everyone came out alive. At that time in April 1938, the Jews were only a small minority in Dachau. The majority were political prisoners, socialists, communists, Christian Democrats, Jehovah Witnesses, Roma, and criminals. There was also a separate barracks for homosexual prisoners with whom we had hardly any contact. Dachau was a manicured camp surrounded with electrical barbed wire. There were very deep trenches with a grass border. Every few hundred meters, there was a watchtower armed by SS men, SS men with machine guns and searchlights. Whenever a prisoner, by, even by mistake, stepped on the grass border, guns started to fire. In our, bar in our barracks, there was a weakly young man who had a prominent hunchback. He was especially mistreated by the, mistreated by the SS. He was abused in a very vicious way. The big guard dogs were trained to jump on him, bite him, and knock him over. Only after a few days, he became delirious and died one night. Many prisoners lost their eyeglasses after their beatings and couldn't see without them. Some older prisoners lost their teeth and had a problem eating. We had to work very hard and very long hours. One night, the sirens started to blare, which was a sign that a prisoner was trying to escape. The door of our barracks was opened, and two SS men with their dogs came in. I was sleeping near the door. They took me and another prisoner. We were forced to run to the deep ditch with the electrical barbed wire. I was sure that they would force us to try to touch it, and then report shot while trying to escape. We were lucky. At the same time, another prisoner tried to escape, but was electrocuted. He was lying in the ditch. We had to pull his body out. In June 1939, I'm sorry, in June 1938, I was transferred along with another, with many others to a new camp which started in 1937. This was Buchenwald. It was much more dangerous, a Wild West camp located on a hill in a forest. On November 9th or 10th, 1938, all prisoners were taken to a parade grounds where we were left standing in the bitter cold for many hours. Many collapsed. Then prisoners with the name Grunspan were called out. Their hands were tied behind their backs, and they were pulled up on meat hooks and left hanging on trees for many hours. We were informed over the loudspeaker that a Jewish criminal with the name of Grunspan had killed a German official in Paris. In the next few days, thousands of Jewish prisoners were brought in. 
Only after we had contact with the newcomers did we find out what happened in Kristallnacht in Germany and Austria. It was a very cold winter with rain, snow, and ice. Our prison uniforms were very thin, and we were working in stone quarries, digging deep ditches, or carrying heavy loads without gloves. You couldn't save bread for the next day because the rats would eat it. Then a typhus epidemic started and many died, including a friend of mine, Jura Seufer, who died in February 1939. He was a well-known and talented cabaret writer and journalist in Vienna. He composed the song, The Dachau Lied, while imprisoned. After one year of imprisonment in Dachau and Buchenwald, I was released on April 14, 1939, and went home to Vienna. I then found out on the following day after I was arrested, my brother, Kurt, fled Austria after obtaining a visa for Columbia, South America. I received papers and affidavit to go to America, and I left for England in June 1939. Um, I will continue at this point. One must realize that my father had no relatives living in the US and that there, was, there were very strict quotas to enter. My father was able to travel to Great Britain and stay there temporarily because he was given an affidavit to enter the US by a total stranger by the name of a man named Joseph Sutton, a Jewish American citizen whose family had emigrated from Aleppo years before. He learned of my father's plight and assisted my father. In England, my father lived in Richborough Transit Camp, also known as Kitchener Camp near Sandwich, Kent. Between February 1939 and the outbreak of World War II in September 1939, just under 4,000 adult Jewish male refugees lived in this old First World War military base. It was funded and supported by British Jewish philanthropists. My father came to New York City through Ellis Island in March 1940. He was desperate to get his parents out of Austria, but tragically, this was not to be. Conditions continued to worsen for the Jews in the Reich. More and more restrictions were imposed on them. My grandparents, along with other Jewish families who live in their apartment building, were compelled to house other Jews who were physically forced out of their homes in other neighborhoods. My grandfather's business was looted on, on Kristallnacht and eventually Aryanized. The family-owned cafes and other businesses were all Aryanized and were taken over by opportunistic Viennese. As more deportation transports were occurring and under dire conditions, my grandmother committed suicide in her home on May 23, 1941. My grandfather was deported to Riga, Latvia, on January 26, 1942, and did not survive the transport. My father's maternal aunts and uncles, who lived in Vienna, all made plans to flee Austria after the Anschluss in March 1938. His uncle Friedrich, with his wife and two stepchildren, fled to Bruno, Czechoslovakia. Friedrich was arrested there in September 1941 and was murdered in Mauthausen in October 1941. His wife and the children were deported to Reichenstadt and then transported to Poland where they were murdered. My dad's uncle Oscar fled illegally on a boat with other Austrian Jews which traveled down the Danube and eventually made its way to British controlled Palestine. He was killed along with 137 other civilians in a bombing of Tel Aviv by fascist Italian Air Force planes on September 9th, 1940. When it was no longer possible to leave legally, my father's aunts, Finney and Berta, paid a smuggler and crossed legally with their teenage sons in waist-high snow over the border into Yugoslavia in the winter of 1941. When the Nazis invaded Yugoslavia, they crossed the border into Italy where they found temporary refuge. When the situation worsened under the Germans, they fled to Switzerland where they were interned, but not turned back. My dad's Aunt Haiti found refuge in Alexandria, Egypt. On my paternal grandfather's side, apart from my dad's Aunt Bella, who survived in the Budapest ghetto, all of his other aunts and uncles who lived in Gier, Hungary, were deported to Auschwitz in 1944 and were either murdered upon arrival in Auschwitz or worked to death in Mauthausen after being transferred there. My mother fled Vienna in June 1939, 
on a kinder transport to Scotland. She arrived in the US in 1941. My parents met my mother's aunt's apartment on the Upper West Side. My father was renting a room from her aunt. They were married on June 20th, 1943 in New York City. My father served in the American Army at Camp Ritchie, Maryland in intelligence and counterintelligence. He was one of the Ritchie boys. Approximately 2,000 or 10% of the soldiers who trained at Camp Ritchie were German and Austrian Jewish refugees. Their fluency in, German, in the German language and knowledge of German customs enhanced their intelligent work. After being in the US for less than 10 years, and after working for others, my dad opened his own custom tailoring business in 1949. He had, a very renowned, he had very renowned clients, including Joe DiMaggio, Leonard Bernstein, Luciana Pavarotti, Itzhak Perlman, Pincus Zuckerman, Eric Fromm, Mayor Robert Wagner, and the list goes on. My father was very concerned with the state of our sometimes very broken world. He was a realist and knew that the world had terrible flaws and he certainly had first-hand experience in his own life to confirm this. But he was also extremely aware of the importance of repairing this broken world and the concern of living in a just and moral and civil society. He was mindful of the underdog and those oppressed and maltreated. He was a very big advocate and supporter of Hayas, the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, the very organization that helped him as a young refugee in this country as well as helping present day refugees. But much more serious than this, when the torture of Abu Ghraib came to light almost 20 years ago, my father wrote a poignant letter to the New York Times. It was published on May 17th, 2004. It read as follows. The horror revisited. To the editor, it was with dismay and horror that I viewed the photo of a cowering Iraqi prisoner menaced by vicious military guard dogs at Abu Ghraib prison, front page May 10th, as an Austrian Jew imprisoned in Dachau and Buchenwald in 1938 and 1939, I was an eyewitness to similar inhumane behavior by sadistic Nazi guards. Otto Pearl, Teaneck, New Jersey, May 12th, 2004. Lastly, my father wanted me to be aware and mindful of any kind of extremism, be it religious or political, as well as to be prepared and confront and overcome difficulties and hardships in our own lives with a strong work ethic and have a sense of moral responsibility. I think he instilled this in me and my siblings as well as his grandchildren. My father died on February 6, 2014 at the age of 98. Three months after his death, in May of that year, I traveled to Vienna with my mother to dedicate Stolpersteine stumbling blocks, brass plaques in front of the building where my grandparents had lived. Coincidentally, it was the same building where my mother's maternal grandmother and her twin uncles lived. Both her uncles were deported and also murdered during the Shoah, and their names are memorialized on this plaque. In 2018, the Jewish Museum of Vienna marked the 100th anniversary of the birth of the composer and conductor Leonard Bernstein. Featured in the exhibit were conducting, conducting dress tales, photos, and other ephemera, which I donated or lent, showing my father's decades-long connection as Bernstein's custom tailor and his friend. It was very moving to have my father's life story acknowledged in the city of his youth, a city which he loved dearly, but ultimately betrayed him. On November 9th, 2021, the 83rd anniversary of Kristallnacht, my husband Richard and I attended the opening of the Austrian Shoah Wall of Names Memorial after I received an invitation from the Austrian government. This memorial, located in Vienna's 9th district, has the names of over 64,000 Austrian Jews who perished in the Shoah inscribed on its walls including the names of my grandparents, great-grandparents, great-aunts and uncles, and other extended family members. My father strongly agreed with the statement that we must learn from our experiences and from history, that when one freedom is taken away from one group, sooner or later, everyone will suffer. Thank you. <laughs>